We have been uh, looking at the book of James for oh, the last three months or so. Tonight, we want to mosey along into, uh, into uh, chapter 4. If you'd like to open your Bibles to James chapter 4. Uh, believe it or not, we're going to get all the way through the end of James 5 by the end of next week. Well, we won't be finished with the subject, but we'll at least uh, take a look at everything, okay? Um, another thing that I want to remind you of tonight, that um, the Word of God is the final authority. Jesus uh, reminds us that even if heaven and earth pass away, His Word will never pass away. He watches over His Word to perform it. And so that's where we need to go for understanding and wisdom and knowledge. And He is to be our authority. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, then... Uh, then He's going to lead and guide us into all the truth. And He's going to lead and guide us into things that perhaps we haven't been exposed to or weren't, weren't so sure about. Um, remember where we're headed in James. I haven't said it for a couple of weeks. James, written by the half-brother of Jesus, is taking to us to the place at the end of chapter 5 where he says, Is there any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of in faith will restore the one who's sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven. It's pretty emphatic. But one of the mistakes we make as Americans and as believers is we want to take shortcuts. And that's why I thought it was worthy of our investment the last three or four months being in James. Because James is laying out for us the conditions of our walk and our relationship with God. So that when we have our hearts in tune with God and we come to the place we pray for the sick people, they get well. I told you a story years ago when I was pastor of Baptist Church in Mesa back in, when I was a kid back in the 70s. I was 23, 24 years old. And uh, we were just starting to learn about some of these things. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the other Baptist leaders came to me and said... Uh, said, Rick, I want to I tell you about, about two times we prayed for somebody who was sick, like the Bible says to. There was a pastor who was in the hospital. I don't recall what it, the sickness was, not expected to live. A group of preachers went in from the other churches, laid hands on him, prayed for him, and the Lord healed him. In about two days, he got up and went home, and he was fine. And they thought, wow, this is really awesome. It's just like what the Bible says. And a few months later, a pastor's wife was sick, and they went to the hospital and anointed her with oil and prayed for her, and she died. And these are his exact words. So we never did that again. You see, one of our problem is, problems is that we want to take what God says and reduce it down to where we're living. And if what we're experiencing is not what the Scripture says, then we'll get somebody to write a book or explain it away for us so that we can just be comfortable where we're living. Folks, the problem when we see things the Scripture says and we're not seeing those results, the problem isn't with God. God hasn't changed. The problem's with us. The problem is on our end. And you may be aware in the Minor Prophets it says about God's people, He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that knowledge we're talking about is the real knowledge from the Word of God. And so that's what we're trying to do is grasp some of that knowledge here tonight. James chapter 4 then says to us, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it, is it not your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you don't have, so you commit murder. Now, if James is writing people who are believers, I don't think that they were taking uh, you know, swords and chopping each other's heads off. But you remember what Jesus said? If you hate someone in your heart, You've already murdered him. And so I suspect that that's probably what James is referring to. And he's being a little bit, uh, maybe using a little hyperbole here to get the point across that you commit murder. You're killing one another in, their, in your relationships and with your hatred. He says you're envious, you can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel, and you don't have because you don't ask. And James could recognize immediately that some people would respond and say, wait a minute, we did. We had a prayer meeting, we asked. Nothing happened. He said, oh yeah, you ask sometimes, but you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so you may spend it on your pleasures. And then he says, you adulteresses, do you not know 
that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, what is he talking about by calling them adulteresses? We, last year about this time, we were wrapping up a study on spiritual adultery out of Romans 6, 7, and 8. And what we saw is Paul saying, the thing I want to do, I don't do. I'm doing the very thing I hate. And he says, it's the sin that dwells in me. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I used to point to that passage and say, oh, Paul's like me. But in the reality, Romans 7 is a description of the man who is in spiritual adultery. And here is the way it works. We were born with our flesh nature married to this world system. If you will, we're the bride, the world system, in which, uh, by the way, the Bible says that Satan is the god of this world, so he's in charge of that. We come along, we hear about Jesus, the Son of God, living a sinless life, and He died and shed His blood so we could be forgiven of our sins. We say, sure, I want to be forgiven. I want to go to heaven. I want to live forever. And so we say, Jesus, I want to be married to you. And Romans 7 is the person is right here in spiritual adultery. And what Paul goes on to say is that we have to die to that first husband and be devoted only to Jesus. But while we're here, we're miserable and the thing we want to do, we don't do. We do the very thing that we hate. And Paul goes on to tell us we don't have to stay there because Romans, this is really brilliant, don't miss this, one of the great nuggets tonight, Romans chapter 8 comes after Romans chapter 7. <laughs> Thought you'd be impressed. I'll tell you what, if I'd have figured that out about 25, 35 years ago, I'd have been a lot better off in my walk with God. Romans 7 is this. Romans 8 is we overcome sin and ungodliness and the control of this world system in our lives, and we're devoted to Jesus. And that's why Jesus said His proof for faith. You think about all the different backgrounds, and we come from varied backgrounds. We have, we have people who are raised... Baptists like me and people from the Assemblies of God and Pentecostal and Lutheran churches and Catholic and uh, Presbyterian. And we have a lot of different backgrounds that could go on and on and on. And we've all been told slightly different things about what the proof of faith is. Here's what Jesus said. If you believe in me, faith, then here's how you can tell. You ready? The works that I do shall you do also. So how many people of faith do you know? See, if I really believe... Okay. <laughs> Throw them in here. Let them down. You see, I really believe that's one of those things where we took what Jesus said and we said, well, He didn't really mean that. And we explained the way. And the next thing you know, we can act like the devil, hold on to the golden ticket our church issue does and think we're going to be in the front row in heaven. Jesus said the proof of believing in me Put it in here, blood, simmer. Go look. Go check and see. He said, the works that I do, you're going to do too. In fact, he said, you're going to do greater works than these. I think we see some of those in the book of Acts. One illustration is Peter's walking down the street. They're dragging sick people out. And when a shadow passes over them, the power of God was so strong on Peter that they were healed. I don't know any place the Scripture says that the shadow of Jesus called any sick person to get well. He healed everybody who came and made requests of Him. He healed every kind of sickness and disease. Raised His best friend Lazarus from the dead. And we have testimonies of people in our own congregation that that happened and a whole bunch of people from our church were at one where Maddie Klein had been dead for, medically dead for almost an hour. And they were praying and the Lord brought her back to life after they had already said, call the mortuary. That's from uh, Mount Butte. Mount Vista Hospital over here. They call her the Miracle of Mountain Vista for a while. God, folks, God hasn't quit doing what He's doing. We have just refused to meet His conditions so that we can live up here where He's calling us to. And this isn't a matter of us earning some sort of standing with God. These are not rewards for good behavior or merit badges. This is the norm in walking with God when we walk up here where He wants us to. And that is dying to that first husband. My flesh doesn't want to forgive those who wrong me. And I know I've been over this, but I, I keep coming back to this because it's, it's so, 
It's so controversial in American churches, and it shouldn't be. Because that's the basic thing Jesus came to do to set the captive free. We've been enslaved to this world. Jesus came to set us free so we can be devoted to Him. And we're devoted to Him. Guess what? We get to live in His kingdom right here, right now in this world. And we've had a few little tastes of it, a little sample. Isn't that awesome? And so when He says you adulteresses, that's what He's referring to. There's a whole lot behind that. We're going to press on because this next little segment is so significant, especially if you're going to really start acting on what we've been studying and seeing here and praying for sick people or praying for your spouse or your neighbor when they're sick. Here is the passage you can always come to because he's moving into something here that is, is really powerful and concise about getting into the resources of God for healing. Uh, by the way, let me just reiterate, gosh, it's probably been two weeks since I said this. No, it's been a month. Some of you are like, okay, he's got that list. He's always got to throw that out there. There is no power in prayer. Okay? This is an important point. There is no power in prayer. There's power in God and in His kingdom. And He makes that available to us through the medium of prayer. We take hold of His hand and we call on Him and God acts. It's not our words. It's not how we say it. But it is our request to Him. So the power is in God. You say, well, you're splitting hairs. Let me tell you, it's an important hair that needs to be split. Because I know people that think the blessings in their lives are because of their powerful words and their positive attitude. It has nothing to do with it. If our heart's set on God, we are going to have a positive attitude. The Scripture tells us that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And so, we cry out to God, and when He acts, things happen. And we've been eyewitnesses to a lot of that. So he says here in verse 5, Do you think the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. God actually wants us, His creation, to want Him and to want a relationship with Him. Imagine that. You know, I've, I've never had anybody come to me and say, Hey, Rick, I want you to go on business with me. And after they see the way I run a business, they'd say, stay away. It's actually our business is doing much better that I'm staying away from it. <laughs> but, but God says, I want a relationship with you. I want you to know me. I want to do business with you. In verse 6, He gives a greater grace. I have to stop there again. You know, we watched that video last week about He who controls the language controls the message in society. And we saw this video about how in, in the social, political, Hollywood, media realm that they're taking words that have had a meaning for a long time and they're making them say different things. Or they're describing a circumstance and instead of being truthful about it, they call it by a different name. And... Uh, and the whole reason for doing that is an attempt to deceive. There are things like that in the Bible that you and I misunderstand because somebody told us this is what they mean. And the most graphic example is the word grace. Most of us were taught grace is undeserved favor. That is not what grace is. You try to plug that definition into a lot of different things the Scripture says about grace and it does not fit. Grace is not undeserved or unmerited favor. That's mercy. God is merciful. He gives us His favor even though we're not deserving of it. It wasn't that we loved Christ, but that He loved us first. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is mercy. His grace is the influence of His Spirit in our hearts and lives that empowers us to walk in His ways. That's how we grow in grace as we die to jealousy, uh, selfishness, unforgiveness, bitterness, lust, greed, arrogance, pride. We die to those things in the world so that we're devoted to Jesus and we bear that beautiful fruit of the Holy Spirit instead. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what He produces in us. That's His grace, His influence that does that for us. So God gives the greater grace, greater influence. 
And he says this, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace, His influence, to the humble. So what we're going to see now are seven steps to getting into the presence of God. One of the passages that we've read numerous times, we won't go to tonight, says this. Jesus was present, He was teaching, there was a crowd, and all of these religious critics, religious leaders were there. And the Bible simply says, and the power of the Lord was present for Him to perform the work. Pretty extraordinary. Because there were times there was so much unbelief, Jesus would take the sick person away from the crowd. Or He would send everyone else out and keep His closest friends that He knew were strong in the Lord, Peter, James, and John. And just they were there when Jesus would minister. He would get away from unbelief. In fact, if you can imagine Jesus, even though He's the Son of God, God in human form, fully man, fully God, my mind can't understand that, but that's the reality of what the Scripture teaches. There are just, just amazing things that Jesus was saying can be done in and through us as human beings as we're yielded to Him. But even Jesus in several places, the Bible says He could do no miracle there. And He wondered at their unbelief. And so, in these seven steps, it shows how to get into the presence of God. Whether it's a wounded heart, sin that's controlled your life, or a sickness or a disease, these seven steps are the most concise description of how to get into the presence of God. And uh, you may like to just take your pen there and number them in your Bible or make a note of them. But we're going to look at these seven things. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to His influence to the humble. Step one, humble yourself. I have to tell you that humility is a thing that Americans have a difficult time understanding or comprehending. Uh, I've known people that were very humble, but it, it's rare and it's, it's exceptional. Uh, but I, I think probably the, the short time that I spent in India with a group of people and we're teaching and praying for sick people and watching God do the most amazing things, I think I learned what it means to see people who are really humble. And it's not about poverty. We're not talking about prosperity and poverty. We're talking about a demeanor and an attitude in their heart where they always considered the other person is more important than themselves. Pretty amazing. And that's what the Scripture says to do. Humble yourself. Say, God, I haven't got it all figured out. I understand all these things. I'm not better than other people. And Lord, I'm, I'm just seeking You as Your child. Step one, to get in the presence of God. Humble yourself. Step two, Submit, therefore, to God. Most of us have heard uh, through the years somewhere about wives submitting to husbands. Of course, the you know, Christian, American Christian churches are trying to throw that away because the world system doesn't like that. And so you think, oh, well, submission, that, that's for wives. No, it's not. Submission is for every human being. You cannot have a relationship with God unless you voluntarily choose to yield yourself, to submit yourself to Him. We're all called upon to submit to God. And that's what he's saying right here. Submit yourself to God. How do you submit to God? I like this, uh, this description that King David gave to his son Solomon. You go back in, in Kings and Chronicles and read it. And, and he said, Know the God of your father and serve Him with a whole heart and a willing mind. That's what he told his son to do. For he says, the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. And he tells his own son, if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, here's what David said to his own son. He will reject you forever. That's what David said to Solomon. And that truth still stands today. How does it mean to submit to God? What? Everything in my life can be measured by it. God, here is, here's my time. Here are my material resources. Here are my talents and abilities. Um, here's my body. Here I am. Anything by which you can measure my life. Now, God, you show me anything in this that's not pleasing to you and it's gone with yesterday's garbage. Oh, and by the way, if anything is missing, God, I will welcome that into my life. That's submitting 
yourself to God. So to get into God's presence, the second thing is to submit yourself to God. Third thing, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Most of us in America have been taught to ignore the devil. Well, you know the devil, he may be working in Africa or India or somewhere, maybe down in Mexico or San Francisco or New York, but he's not at work in Florence. Well, maybe maybe on the east side of Highway 79, maybe he's at work. No, folks, he is working, he's right here present tonight in this room. Because the reason I know that is because Jesus said that whenever the Word of God is shared, the seed is spread, that if your heart is resistant to it, the powers of darkness come and steal the seed of God's Word right out of your heart. And by the way, that's a serious thing. Because according to the Scripture, you are not born again by praying and prayer. I started to walk with God by praying and prayer. But you're not born again by praying and prayer. You are born again by the Word of God, the Scripture tells us. And that's in 1 Peter. And it says this Word must be implanted in our hearts. That's why Jesus told the parable of the soils. He described four kinds of hearts, and everybody in this room is one of those kinds of hearts. And the fourth kind are the one that, that's walking with Him. The seed comes in, it's moistened by the Holy Spirit, and it produces a crop 30, 60, and 100 fold. We're born again by the Word of God. It's a pretty serious thing. If we resist the Word of God, the powers of darkness can steal it right out of our hearts, and that's why I know that He's around here. So he says, resist the devil takes action. You have to be alive to resist the devil. And by the way, sometimes I call him by name. He's bugging you, harassing you. Resist him in Jesus' name and speak it out. I used to, uh, when I was being trained as an instrument tech and electrician at the power plant where I worked while I was pastoring in Colorado, I go up to Craig, Colorado. I spent 28 weeks and the Holiday Inn in Craig, Colorado. I was talking to somebody the other day. They said, I've been there. I was probably there at the same time they were. Now, you know, a lot of stuff goes on when you've got contractors and hunters away from their families and all. And sometimes the messages that are left on telephones are things that you don't want to hear. Uh, conversations where women are calling men, trying to make connections with them and everything. And so you can imagine all the junk the enemy tries to put on. I have to spend a week up there going to class. And, and so... Uh, I finally got to where I would go to the room and if nobody was there, I would open the door and I'd go, Get out! In Jesus' name. And I would just shout it like that. Suicide, you know, lust, all of this kind of junk that, that hangs around there. Those spirits hang around there. And we have authority in Jesus' name telling them to get out. And then we can have to go in peace. Don't get tormented. Don't have nightmares. Have peace. Walking with God. Resist the devil. And by the way, he's defeated. Jesus has already given us a victory. And he has to flee. So we've got humbling ourselves, submitting to God. Number three, resist the devil. Number four, draw near to God. And guess what? He'll draw near to you. Draw near to God. How do you do that? Do you know that I went to church my entire life? My earliest childhood memories. Waking up asleep on the pew, standing up. And I, I still remember. And then I later found out I'm just really delighted to tell you my folks were joining Southside Baptist Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. And guess who went to church there? Bill Clinton. Yes. I'm really proud to tell you about that. <laughs> Talk about fruit, right? Okay? You see, Jesus said, not by the church they go to, not by what they say with their words, by the fruit they bear in their life. It proves what their heart is. By the fruit, you know. I'm standing on the view and there my Lady scoops me up. Sweet grandma, carried me down there. That was back when I used to think grandmas were old. <laughs> Long time ago. Great grandmas, looking pretty young to me now. <laughs> See, my whole life I've been in that position of being around churches. And you know you go to church your whole life and not in your heart actually be drawing near to God. I've been to some churches where it was about fashion show. And by the way, I love for ladies to dress up, look nice, smell nice. It's a good thing. I like for guys to smell nice. <laughs> guys, I do remind you, as we age, our olfactory nerve doesn't work as well as it used to. The young guard, okay? Pay attention. Go ahead and ask your wife. Let me know if I'm, you know, being a little bit odorous or something. 
It's a, it's not to be about those things. When we gather together, it's about our hearts drawing near to God. And I can tell you there are people that go to church over and over and over again. I see a group in Casa Grande go to church every day. I don't know if they're really trying to draw near to God or if they're just trying to impress the, the priests or the people at the church. I don't know. But in your heart, God said, if you seek me, I'll let you find me. We have to make that conscious decision to say, God, I want to draw near to you. And if we're going to get in His presence, obviously we need to do that. Then He says, by the way, when you do that, He'll draw near to you. You draw near, you know, draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. Because He's searching for people who are looking for Him. Step five. When you start getting close to God, guess what you become aware of? Your sinfulness. Your mistakes. Your conscience remind you, the Holy Spirit reminds you of things that you need to repent for. So that's the next thing you do is you repent and you ask for forgiveness. I'll remind you of three main things that Jesus did. Jesus did not die on the cross for your sins. Okay, hear me. Okay. Jesus shed His blood for the forgiveness of your sins. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And of course, shedding His blood requires the giving of His life. He died on the cross to free us from the curses of the law. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So He shed His blood, so I repent and the blood of Jesus washes me clean of my sins. And He died on the cross so I can be free from the curses of the law. And if you want to know what they are, just make a note. Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. Those are specific enumerations of the curses of the law. And by the way, those of you who have been told the law has all passed away, i got news for you. Jesus didn't know that. He said, don't even think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I didn't. I came to fulfill them. And He came to fulfill them in us. And so I remember for years reading Deuteronomy 28. And I'm going, God, I see in their description of things that I see in every congregation I pastor, I see some things in my own body. And I said, since the law's all passed away, how come I see these things from Deuteronomy 28 in my congregation, in my family, and in my own body? And guess what? God said to me, nothing. He just waited. I kept saying, God sent up. And then one day I said, God, do you mean the law hasn't and its judgment and the curses have not passed away? And guess what? He opened the floodgates and I find all over the Scripture. Now, those of you who say, oh, no, 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 all the curses already passed away. But just hold on. Mark down, just put in your mind to go read the last chapter of the Bible when we're all gathered by the river or the water of life. We're in heaven with God. And guess what? That's when it says, then there shall no longer be any curse. But didn't Jesus become the curse for us? Yes, He did. But didn't Jesus shed His blood for the sins of the world? Nod your head. Or be from India and go wag it. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay? Didn't Jesus shed His blood for the sins of the world? Well, yes, yes, yes. Well, then why are we evangelizing and worried about it? Everybody's going to go to heaven. No, 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 no. Only those who receive and appropriate that for themselves get their forgiveness. Only the ones who meet the conditions, which is repent, seek the Lord with all of your heart. Guess what? Jesus died on the cross to free us from the curses of the law. Who gets the curses forgiven? Those who receive it. And the third main thing Jesus did was He took sickness and disease in His body. By His stripes, by His wounds, He bought physical healing for you and me. Jerem I mean, uh, Isaiah described it. 800 years before Jesus came, He looked forward to the coming of Messiah. Didn't know Him as Jesus of Nazareth, just as the coming one. And he said, by his stripes, we are healed. In Jeremiah's, I mean, Isaiah's time, Jeremiah's time, Ezekiel's time, in Elijah's time, in Moses' time, they had healing. How? Because Jesus was going to take all sickness and disease for us. And so who gets their healing of sickness and disease? Those who learn 
to receive that from Him. So, cleanse your hands. Repent. Purify your heart. So, so really, verse 5 is telling us to repent. Recognize and agree with God that what we did was wrong and admit it. Folks, you can't walk with God without humbling yourself and admitting you failed. I know some people that it's... Oh, I apologize, Mark, for saying this. It's like pulling teeth to get them to admit they ever did anything that was wrong. It reminds them of work. You know, you can't get away from it, you know? <laughs> but it's like pulling teeth to get people to be humble enough to say, I was wrong. Get over yourself, okay? We're all flawed and we're all broken. And I can tell you, your church may have taught you how to put on a great mask and put on a good show. My wife and I learned to do that. You know, I told you, we ride in the church or a bus and inviting the kids are in the back seat watching us. We open the doors and magically everything's fine, wonderful, aren't we blessed? And isn't God great? We get back in the car. <laughs> See, get over it because we're all flawed, we're all broken. It's just a matter of what kind of brokenness it is. But you need to humble yourself and say, God, I'm broken. God says, I'm glad you finally figured that out. Now we can do some business. Repent. Cleanse your hands. Purify your hearts. And then he says, verse 9, Be miserable. Mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. You know what that is? You can take that whole verse and summarize it with one word. Brokenness. To realize how we've broken God's heart by our conduct and by our deeds. And we're broken over that. Let me tell you, when we go to praying for people, if you walk through these and the Holy Spirit of God convicts them and they're really touched and brokenness comes, I love praying for people when there's real brokenness. Now, we don't want to manufacture. We don't want to tell people, oh, you got to cry here. I'll pinch you and help you cry. No, 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 no. no. Okay? We don't, we don't need, we don't, we're not staging anything. Folks, this is a real walk with the living God. And I can guarantee you, every time we pray for people, if God doesn't touch them, they're not going to get well. And it doesn't matter how eloquent of prayer I pray or how many times I rebuke the devil. He's not moving until there's a change in heart. There has to be repentance. But when there's brokenness, why is it powerful? And we've seen the Lord do some of the most amazing things in healing people when they meet God from their heart in those conditions. Rick, does every time there's brokenness, does, does somebody get healed? No. We're still learning. We're still scratching our heads. Okay? But you know what? We're not going to take and change the words of Jesus or James so we're comfortable here. We're going to say, we've got some growing to do, some learning to do. God's up to something. God's doing something. And His Word, let it be true even if every man's a liar. So brokenness, miserable morning week, let your laughter return to morning and joy to gloom. Humble yourself. Now, step seven, here it is. Wait a minute, Rick, didn't we already have humble? That's how important it is to God. He had James write it twice. Humble yourselves now. Look in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Isn't God good? Seven steps. I would encourage you, if you're trying to get somebody that needs some help, some healing, walk them through these seven steps. That's a pretty good guy. And then see what the Lord does in their heart. No, there's, there are no magic words. There's no magic formula. It's about us connecting with the living God and asking for more mercy and His influence is grace. And He loves to do that. One of the, His names, one of His Hebrew names is healer. I, the Lord, am your healer. He wants us to look to Him, to reach out to Him for that. For that I want you to go with me to uh, look at an example of this in 2 Kings. One of my favorite healing stories from way back. Now remember in the books of history, you've got two boys and a girl, three sets of twins. You've got Joshua Judges Ruth, 
Ruth, we got your book going there. Okay. Two boys and a girl. Three sets of twins. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, and then two boys and a girl. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And we're going to look at a couple of those here. Second Kings 20 of the chapter. Second Kings 20. Hopefully I got the reference correct. Ah, yes. Do you ever have a, a leader, teacher, pastor trying to be a smart aleck and embarrass you and say, open the book of Hezekiah and then listen for the ruffling of the pages? I knew a couple of young pastors did that. I'm kind of like, guys, if I was sitting in the congregation, you said that, I'd start flipping and then go, wait a minute, there is no book. But there is a king named Hezekiah. 2 Kings, 20th chapter, verse 1, In those days Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and says, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Wow. Okie dokie, God. The Lord has spoken. By the way, there is a time to die. It is appointed unto man once to die. When we look at the ten different reasons that we know of why, why people are physically sick, I'm going to be teaching those, sharing those in uh, Michigan here in, in about three weeks uh, with our folks from Florence Garden, Queen Valley, all live in western Michigan. We're going to look at all ten of those reasons. But um, one of those reasons is a sickness unto death when it's time to go. So he says, put your house in order. But look what happens in verse 2. He turned his face to the wall. You know what he's doing when he turns his face to the wall? He's humbling himself. He, he's, he's on a sick bed, apparently. And he turns his face to the wall and he begins to cry out to the Lord. He, he's drawing near to God. He's, uh, he's asking for God's presence. He prayed to the Lord saying, Remember now, Lord, I beseech Thee. I have walked before Thee in truth with a whole heart and have done what is good in Thy sight. And look at this brokenness. Hezekiah wept bitterly. Wow. Almost so, sounds like what Job did when Job justified himself. Then. It does a little bit, doesn't it? Because Job was talking about his righteousness and his faithfulness. He's saying, and he's really in a sense, he's boldly coming to God saying, God, haven't I done some of these things here? And, and he, I tell you what, that, that, that's kind of interesting to see that, isn't it? But you see a transformation is going on in Hezekiah's heart. And he's really humbling himself. And so, um, yeah, it does, it does uh, sound kind of like what Job did. And of course, Job's problem was that his friends had bad theology. They'd been to one of those conferences that said, if you have enough faith, you'll never be sick. By the way, that's, that's not what the Bible says. By the way, faith is an important ingredient in a relationship with God. We can't have a relationship without it. But faith isn't the only thing that has to be there for the presence of God for healing to take place. But Job's friends are like, hey, you wouldn't be sick like this. This tragedy wouldn't happen. You must have really done something bad. They apparently went to some of the same churches that I grew up in. <clears throat> They've been influenced by the teachings of men instead of the truth from God. And so, he's, he's weeping. And it came about before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court. So he's at the palace. He's about to leave. God said, go tell him. Get your house in order. You're going to die. And he's headed out the door. And uh, that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord God of your father David. Listen to what God says. I've heard your prayer. So he really was drawing near to God in his heart and crying out to him. I've heard your prayer. And this one blew me away. So I'm kind of like, nah. First time somebody said, you know, God keeps all of our tears in a bottle of wood. See, that's part of how I learned to put things in a pot and let them simmer. Because I'm reading along in Scripture and it says, God saves all of your tears in the bottle. Wow. God says, I've seen your tears. Why were, were the tears important? Now see, we have four sons. Uh, a couple of them were pretty good with alligator tears. You know what I mean? Just for show. Mommy, my brothers are harassing me. 
Aaron was guilty of part of that, by the way. <laughs> Aaron and Nathan picking on. It's funny, we have four kids, so there shouldn't be a middle son, but there is, uh, you know. So <clears throat> this thing of genuine tears as, as, as a reflection of something going on in the heart. And he said, uh, I've seen your tears, and I will heal you. And on the third day, you go up to the house of the Lord, and I'll add 15 years to your life. And I'll deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city for my own sake, for my servant David's sake. Now here's an interesting thing. And Isaiah said, take a cake of figs, put it on the boil, he had an infection. And you get well. Isn't that interesting? Well, why you know, wonder why did you spit on the ground, make clay, put it on the eyes and rinse? Why did they tell Naaman the leper, go dip in the uh, the Jordan River? Uh, he had psoriasis like like I was afflicted with for 49 years. And God's just over this last year been healing me of that. Uh, why, why do you have to do that? And the answer is very simple. I have no idea why God told him to do that. But I know this. If we're listening for the voice of the Lord, then we'll follow what the Lord directs us to do. And he said, put a cake of figs on it. And of course, some of you understand you know, the, the effect that that can have drawing out the infection. That one, of our, uh, one of our sisters, uh, Dorothy MacGyver, is in the hospital to pacemaker she had got infected and they had the pump on there pumping all of the infection and everything drawing it all out well, it's kind of the same thing it's just an early pump sucking it out of there yes no one i was thinking it was the hot well part of it part of it sometimes i think uh, like in naaman the leopard you know he could, naaman the he was the head of the enemy's army and yet by the way god healed him but but you see sometimes there's a test in there for us to see if we're going to humble ourselves and do what the Lord asks us to do. So we need to be listening for what the Lord tells us to do. And then, I, I love this. Uh, this doesn't this really uh, uh, touch you? Hezekiah is going, okay, I believe God, but what's going to be the sign? How will I know that the Lord's going to heal me and that I'll go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? And you remember what happens here. Really, really interesting what happens. Now, now, by the way, what kind of faith is that? He says, okay, God says He's going to heal me. I'll just take that and run with it. But as a guy is like, well, how can I know that He's going to heal me? <laughs> you know what? God wasn't bothered in the least by that. That kind of blows my mind a little bit. I'm like, really? I just don't see myself being in that, in that place. But by the way, there are a few of you that I can see you doing that. How do I know that God's going to heal me? <laughs> we all are built a little bit differently. So. so he says, well, you know, the sun's shining through here on the steps. Uh, do you want the, the sun to go down faster or do you want to go backwards? He says, well, the sun goes down every day. Never have seen it go backwards. I like seeing it go backwards. And so Isaiah prays. And my assumption is that God just rotated the earth backwards on its axis. I don't know if He did it that way or if He moved the sun. I, I, I But the sun went the other way. Now I know it's not like, now that's just you know bizarre and crazy. But let me tell you, if God is God, He is outside the laws of nature. Everything that we operate on, we operate on the assumptions of what we see around us right here. God can do whatever He wants. He doesn't normally do that, but in this case He did. By the way, it's not the only time that He did something with the earth's rotation. You remember the battle they were having? And the Lord made the sun just stand still for a while. Um, there are a lot of things like that that we see in the Scripture that my mind can't understand. But the more that I get to know the living God, the more I go, okay, that's cool. <laughs> I don't understand it, but okay. I believe it. I receive it. So Hezekiah is manifesting some of what we were just talking about. Let's look at the, let's look at the, one more scripture here. Let's go to Psalms. I like, I like this passage in Psalms because David in this passage uh, is sick and he writes about it. Psalm 32, verse 1. Psalm 32. I really like this passage. Uh, for those of you that need the bucket, it'll be up here. 
But uh, what we find is we find all kinds of indications that King David was living in the New Covenant. Do you know, oh, no, no, that can't happen before Jesus. Well, I've you know, got news for you. There's a whole bunch that you've missed in this Bible. We go to Galatians, and Galatians tells us that God gave the New Covenant 450 years before He gave the law. What? He gave it to Abraham. Genesis 15, go back and read about it. it that's God giving the new covenant. We say, wait a minute, why is it called old covenant if it came later? That's because God's a genius. It is. It's because He's a genius. And there are all these twists and turns for people who are looking for something to criticize God and the Scriptures for. God gives them lots of ammunition. Have a good time criticizing it, critiquing it. My Mormon friends tell me, you know, that the Bible's filled with errors and and it's really interesting the little things they pick at and try to say that the Bible is filled with errors. And, uh, and so I, I won't go pursue it in that direction. I used to spend a lot of time sparring with the, my Mormon friends, but uh, you know I'm actually more concerned about my Baptist friends now than about their walk with God. So we'll, we'll, focus, we'll focus on that. But you see, all of us are born first under the law that judges our our marriage to this world system. Paul says that the law is our teacher to make us conscious of sin. That's why the American church is unaware of how rebellious and disobedient to God sin is. It's because the American Christian churches have thrown the so-called Old Testament books away. We just didn't call them Old Testament. We're all born being judged by the law because of our sin. We come along and we can be married to Jesus and we can die to the law of uh, Romans 7 says to be married to Jesus alone. Folks, there's buried treasure in here. And here, you're going to see, you're going to see David acting like he's in the new covenant. Verse 1, Psalm 32, how blessed is the he whose transgressions forgiven his sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now listen, this starts to get personal. Verse 3, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. So through my groaning all day long, he was physically sick. Now if you're here tonight and you're sick, the Bible is not saying that you're sick because of sin. Okay? We know there are at least nine other reasons why people are physically sick. Personal sin is one of them. But by the way, if you are sick because of sin, if you'll repent and ask God's forgiveness, the blood of Jesus will forgive you, and you can be healed. And we've seen God do that. Scores and scores and scores of times over the last 25 years or so. So, I kept silent about my sin. Here he is sick. I'm groaning. Verse 4. For day and night, thy hand was heavy on me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. And then he says, I acknowledge my sin to thee and my iniquity I didn't hide. So, now stop right there and just think about it, okay? David's under the law. He's committed sin. What has he got to do? He's got to get a sacrifice. Might be a lamb. Might be a goat. Could be an oxen. Goes down to the tabernacle. He confesses the sin to the priest. The priest kills the sacrificial animal. Sprinkles the blood on the altar and on the person confessing their sin. And then the priest goes as an intermediary between the confessor and the Lord to help him get forgiveness from God. So, David, you've got to go out. Pick out an animal. Confess your sin to the priest and get forgiveness and listen to what he does. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. No, 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 David, that's new covenant. You can't do that. You can't go confessing your sin to the Lord. You've got to go to the priest. You've got to make sacrifice. He said, I'll confess my transgression to the Lord. And guess what? He said, Thou just forgive the guilt of my sin. He's doing what we do. A thousand years before Jesus Christ was born. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to thee in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they'll not reach him. You're my hiding place. Thou hast preserved me from trouble, and you sound, you surround me with songs of deliverance. Isn't that beautiful? I'll instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I'll counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include brit and, uh, bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they'll not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, 
but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, you righteous ones. Shout for joy, all who are upright in heart. How can he talk about being upright in heart? He just started out saying it was sin. Because he repented, he confessed it to the Lord, and he was forgiven. Well, how could he be forgiven? Jesus hadn't shed his blood yet. Because they were saved by faith looking forward to the Messiah coming in the same way we are saved by looking back to what the Messiah did. Time is of little consequence to God. Uh, we're going to look at it. We're going to look at just a couple other scriptures here. But before we do, uh, Steve Curtis is going to introduce the song we're going to play. Yeah. Okay. Well, I thought this was an admirable uh, song. We're in the book of James, right? And the, uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, Jerry wrote a song called The Devil Made Me Do It. How many guys ever said that to so? <laughs> The devil made me do it. Okay. Look what I, it did. <laughs> she plunked this out on her organ over 20 years ago. I came across it a few months back and I recorded this, the, the, uh, the song to this uh, CD that we're going to play here today. So it's it's a joint effort with, with Jerry and myself. It's called, Have You Ever Said the Devil Made Me Do It? Now, some words to check out is, the devil is temptations. God with inspirations. So if you can't pick out those words. And, and this is all based on uh, the verse in James. Okay? So. Wow. Cool. Go. All right, we're going to play that. Thank you. 
love them. I love music that, uh, that puts scripture that puts scripture into music because it's so much easier for us to uh, to remember and to think about that. And that's really good, resisting the devil. And uh, greater is he who's in us than he who is in the world. Well, that's excellent. Thank you. Thanks for that. And uh, you might have to dust off the keyboard over the church and play again for us one of these days. Well, the sound, the music was definitely too loud. Yeah, I so don't you know what happened. You couldn't hear the words yeah. there. Well, the words were a little bit tough to hear. And uh, maybe next time we can, we can try to get the words up there or something. Well, I don't know if you get the good news, but we're going to be able to start coming to church on That's Sunday what I heard. Because yep. the schedule's changed, so he can actually sing it live. Sometimes that way you'll get it right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good. All right. Um, let's press on here. I want us to uh, go on to Ezra. Uh, if you'll back up just uh, back up a little bit the, in the books of history, after you have the three sets of twins, you have Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Ezra chapter 9. So I hope that uh, this portion that we've been looking at here in James 4, it will be something that you'll mark and you'll refer back to when you go to pray for one another or yeah. friends that need God's touch. In the book of Ezra, you know that they're in captivity when you get to the book of Ezra. Ezra's the, uh, the priest. Um, and God had given them some specific instructions so that they could be... Uh, <laughs> So that they could be preserved through um, through this time of captivity. And of course, they're in captivity because of the wickedness and the sins of the people. And then the religious leaders, spiritual leaders, were not helping them by uh, by speaking God's truth to them. And uh, so the people wound up getting uh, ensnared into some of the uh, ungodly rituals and all of uh, of the nations where they went. So here in Ezra chapter 9, and when these things had been completed, the, the princes approached me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. According to their abominations, those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the uh, Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has been intermingled with the people of the land. Indeed, the hands of the princes and rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. And when I heard about this matter, Ezra says, I tore my garment and my robe, and I pulled some of the hair from my head and my beard, and I sat down a pall. Um, I like to say that that's part of what happened with me, but that, that wasn't it. <laughs> Having four sons did part of that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Lynn says have a wife. Uh, I would I would say I wouldn't say that since it was just her birthday a couple weeks ago. I usually try to be nice for a little bit. So anyway. <clears throat> and so he tore his robe, he sat down appalled, and the people trembled at the words of God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the exiles gathered to me, and I sat appalled until the evening offering. But at the evening offering, I rose from my humiliation, even with my garment and my robe torn, and I fell on my knees, and I stretched out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said in verse 6, O oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to Thee, my God, for our iniquities have risen above our heads, and our guilt has grown even to the heaven." Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt on account of our iniquities. We, our kings, our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the land, to the swords, to captivity, to plunder, to open shame as it is today. Verse 8, <clears throat> but now, for a brief moment, grace, God's influence, has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us an escaped remnant and to give us a peg in His holy place, that our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. 
the grace was God's influence to allow them to realize that they had gotten off track in their deeds, that their leaders had gotten off track, and that was part of the reason they were in the mess that they were in. And so he's coming and really confessing the sins of the whole nation. But I want you to see some of these same characteristics that we saw in Hezekiah, that we saw described in James 4, we see as the manifestation of people who are fully, totally turning their hearts to the Lord. Now, part of this, um, th there's obviously a lot more going on than what can just be recorded right there. But as they intermarried with these other nations, they were adopting some of the religious practices and the wicked practices of those nations. It wasn't just that God wanted the Jewish people to stay a pure race. If that was true, then why was God okay with uh, Moses marrying a woman who wasn't Hebrew? Remember, that's why Miriam and Aaron spoke against their brother. She had married this Midianite woman. And, and so um, that, that wasn't the problem. The problem was as they entered in and, and in a relationship with them, then they began to adopt their religious practices. And there were some pretty horrible things that some of these nations did, like uh, child sacrifice and, and things like this that you can go back and you probably run across some of those things along the way. So, so we're not just talking about them having relationships with their captors, but also adopting their lifestyle. And uh, this is always a problem for God's people because the pressures of society are going to continue to press on and uh, the, on the people of God and try to keep us from doing the things God, God says to do. It's a lot by more the way, fun. What's that? It's a lot more fun to been like them. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's a lot easier just to go along yeah. rather than to take a stand and to resist uh, what's happening. Yeah. He goes on in verse 9, he says, For we're slaves... Yet in our bondage, our God has not forsaken us, but has extended loving kindness to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us reviving, to raise up the house of our God, to restore its reign, to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. Verse 11, which thou hast commanded to thy servants the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands and with their abominations which they have filled it from end to end and with their impurity. So now do not give your daughters to their sons nor take their daughters to yours and never seek their peace or their prosperity that you may be strong. Eat the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your sons forever. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds, and our great guilt, since thou art God, who has requited us less than our iniquities deserve, and have given us an escape remnant as this, shall we again break thy commandments and intermarry with the people who commit these abominations? Wouldst thou not be angry with us to the point of destruction until there's no remnant or anyone to escape? And then he concludes, verse 15, O oh, Lord God of Israel, Thou art righteous. We've been left an escape remnant as it is today. Behold, we are before Thee in our guilt, for no one can stand before Thee because of this. So again, just seeing the demeanor and the attitude of the genuine contrition and humility, humbling themselves, crying out to God and asking for forgiveness for disobeying His guidelines. And uh, as a nation, the people began to move in the right direction. Of course, you know that Ezra was the priest, and then uh, Nehemiah gets permission from the king. God gives them favor, and they're allowed to go back and begin to rebuild the ruined city of Jerusalem, and they begin to rebuild the temple, and, and the whole story of Ezra and Nehemiah is kind of woven together. Which, by the way, I think Ezra and Nehemiah is, is a really good description of what's going on right now in, among God's people. Because the, the people of God on the whole have abandoned the real truths of God and have listened to the traditions of men or the in, taken on the influences of the world instead of standing faithful in God's Word. And that's why the, the church is a broken mess on the whole that it is. That there's as much sin in the church as there is in the world. And so I believe that God's in the process of calling the remnant out and I believe there are little groups like this that nobody pays any attention to scattered all across America where people are really seeking for the light and the truth from God. 
And God is granting that. And as He does, I just want to remind you, you run across some things that seem a little strange. Oh, and Emma's going to help us out here because what you need to do is just throw it right in there and let that sucker uh, let that sucker simmer for a while and ask God to show you because He does confirm His Word in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So I hope tonight that you kind of grasp a little bit um, about this thing of genuinely seeking the Lord. And I have to tell you, there are only a few times in my life that I've been around people that actually began to seek God in that manner. And it's so powerful because God said, if you'll seek me with all of your heart, I'll let you find me. 